throughout Moody Musicology's first decade, the orchestra has been an almost inescapable presence. It is often the primary lens through which scholars and listeners alike view or perhaps listen to video game music. Karen Collins, for instance, began her influential game Sound from 2008 by describing the colorful scene of a video game concert. And in the introduction to the collection Music Video Games, Performance, Politics, and Play from last year, two years ago now, Michael Austin playfully imagines a guitar hero virtuoso performing as a soloist with a major symphony orchestra. Whether as a metaphor or an actual assemblage of people, rosewood, and horsehair, the orchestra seems to stand astride the history of our discipline as we know it. As Will Gibbons, oh, sorry. It also plays a crucial role in the public discourse on video game music. As Will Gibbons reports in a 2015 essay from the Avid Listener, many fans envision orchestral renditions of vintage game music as, quote, the way the music is meant to be heard. And when Will Cheng relates anecdotes of players bragging about their sensitivity for perceiving emotion in the synthesized counterpoint of the famous Final Fantasy VI opera scene, Orchestral and operatic plentitude are obviously present in the discussion, as the excluded terms that devoted imaginative retro game enthusiasts claim not to require, but which are nonetheless considered the implicit ideal. Symphony orchestras and concert promoters alike have been quick to seize on such notions as a way to reach new audiences. In much the same way as civic orchestras have often gestured backwards at the liveness of early silent film music by staging concert performances of recent blockbusters, so too have they sought to animate the mechanical sounds of vintage game soundtracks. In fact, early silent film provides a possible model for the, for the relationship between video games and the symphony. As many scholars have argued, ubiquitous references to opera in early film were attempts both to lay claim to the prestige and cultural capital of that earlier art form, and also to conquer and supersede its treatment of the human voice. And let's not forget that scholars might well be guilty of making the same move. I've done it myself. Of, a, of appealing to the established forms of opera and the symphony in an attempt to stake out a place for ludomusicology within musicology and theory, disciplines not always known for their openness to new repertoires. But today I'd like to think about how we can cast our eyes to slightly less lofty places as we strive to conceptualize the abstraction of 8-bit soundtracks. I'm going to begin with one of the observations that spurred this project about a year ago. So let's listen to an excerpt from the opening of Mega Man 3. First, the original. Next, here's an excerpt of the Swedish Radio Symphony Orchestra performing the same music. So I think there are a lot of great orchestral arrangements of 8-bit music, and this one admittedly has grown on me, but I think if we're talking about the way the music was meant to be heard, this is not it. And uh, I think if you search YouTube, you will find dozens upon dozens of uh, examples that seem to indicate the way people seem to think this music should be heard is this. <laughs> one of many, many hard rock covers on YouTube. Mega Man doesn't lay an exclusive claim to hard rock covers. There are tons of them for all kinds of games, but it does have a conspicuous lack, except for the Swedish Radio Symphony, 
of any other kinds of covers. Nobody thinks to arrange this music for string quartet or accordion or uh, anything else like that. So today I'd like to probe why that might be and why the music of Mega Man so strongly suggests rock and has provoked such an army of amateur guitarists. And also tribute bands like the Megas and the Proto Men, who all seem to have little trouble adapting the soundtracks into entire concept albums about the Blue Bomber. We'll look only at the six classic Mega Man games for the Famicom Nintendo Entertainment System, and I'll present some preliminary findings on a much larger scale study on harmony, form, and style. <coughs> So, the original six Mega Man games were designed by the Japanese company Capcom, released nearly every year from 1987 to 93. Their soundtracks constitute a dense and stylistically cohesive corpus, but remarkably they were composed by six different composers, or sound programmers as Capcom calls them, with only one or two collaborations between games. <clears throat> Manami Matsumai's sound effects for the first game were reused throughout the series, and as with all NES games, they are effectively musical themselves. So this is a picture of the many of the members of the Capcom sound team sometime in the late 80s and early 90s. And it includes several of the composers who worked on the Mega Man series. Manami Matsumai, who wrote the music for the first game, Yasuaki Fujita, Minai Fujii, and Mari Yamaguchi, who wrote soundtracks for later games. And uh, in the back, Yoshihiro Sakaguchi, or, or Yuki-chan's papa, who famously created the sound interface that all of them used to work on Capcom games. Um, also honorable mention to Toshio Kajino in the back who worked on one of the Game Boy versions of Mega Man. And finally, the other people uh, not appearing in this talk. It's clear from various interviews that the Capcom sound team was a tight-knit group. They worked in parallel on various projects, they socialized, and they made music together in their free time. Some of them, like Bun Bun, who wrote music, uh, Mega Man 3, and Isao Abe, who worked on Street Fighter 2, had played in rock bands as teenagers and college students, while others, like Manami Matsumai, talk about being classically trained. <clears throat> so, many of them played together in a band called Alf Lila in the 80s and 90s, and apparently the practice of having a sort of in-house band, a rotating collective of your musicians and sound programmers, um, was not uncommon. At least one other company also had them. SNK was a game developer and they created the Neo Geo. And uh, they also have their own house band that looks straight out of the 80s. <laughs> I'll also note, um, so it seems to be the case that the Capcom musicians played together and all had an interest in actually performing rock music. And I'll also briefly note that this influence would become explicit with Mega Man X on the Super Nintendo in 1993, which has a soundtrack full of synthesized guitars, bass, and actual drums once they were able to do that. But what they were able to do for the first six Mega Man games um, was restricted to the, the hopefully familiar Famicom NES sound system. So just to recap it very quickly, it has five channels of audio. Two of them are pulse waves or square waves, which are generally used for melody, and in this case, sound effects. Triangle wave, uh, generally for the bass, also occasionally for pitched drums, the white noise percussion track, and then the fifth channel is not used in any of the Mega Man games. It's a simple sampler that plays low resolution uh, sound samples, but it's not used for this. As Will Gibbons points out in his essay, Blip Bloop Bach, this arrangement of three melodic channels is ideal for homophonic or contrapuntal textures found in many genres of classical music. But it's also ideal for imitating a rock band. The white noise channel is the drums, the square wave is the bass, or the triangle wave is the bass, <clears throat> and occasionally the tom-toms, and the two pulse channels take on the, the role of guitars, keyboards, other melodies as needed. These arrangements are remarkably consistent throughout the Mega Man games, not only in register, but in the role that a track plays. Lead always on the first, harmony always on the second, being superseded by sound effects when necessary. Unlike, say, Super Mario Brothers, the lead track has zero responsibility for sound effects, in fact. They happen all in the second channel, occasionally aided by the white noise. Mega Man also follows a specific standard structure. Consequently, the soundtracks do as well. Each game begins with the player facing a series of levels named for their final bosses, which you can play in any order. Each level has its own theme. Most of the games have eight bosses. The first one only has six. But if you put them together, along with some of the themes from the end game, we have a corpus of 63 different pieces of music that I looked at. Um, and I invite you, if you're using devices or, uh, or laptops, 
to go to this website, you can see my sort of spreadsheet of data. It's not truly a handout, but if you'd like to refer to it or if you'd like to look at it later, um, there's a little bit there to help you out. That's bit.ly slash mm soundtracks. So the six soundtracks in the classic Mega Man series contain a number of techniques that mark the stylistic influence of rock. The first is very simple, the meter. Every single one of the 63 is in 4-4, and most of them have a backbeat that makes this explicit. In other words, there are no lilting waltzes for underwater levels or skybound levels, no pastoral tunes, nothing ambient or ametric. Let's listen, for example, to the beginning of the final battle of Mega Man 5. <laughs> Classic rock backbeat, right? So the drums in that example are carried out mostly with the white noise channel, a common enough gesture in 8-bit soundtracks. But the Mega Man series is also notable for its simulation of the rest of the drum kit beyond the kick and the snare. This is actually a Capcom technique, as Kevin Burke showed us last year, and it happens in several of their other games. This characteristic drum effect, which you'll hear again in a moment, is created by sweeping the pitch of the triangle wave channel, normally the bass, downward very quickly. So another example from Mega Man 3 shows this very clearly. This is a YouTube cover of a band that uses four synthesizers. They're actually playing into an old Famicom. And if you watch the keyboard on the bottom, he'll demonstrate the drum technique. <laughs> So that's roughly how it works, but you can imagine that being in the, just the assembly language is how they did it uh, on the Famicom. So another feature we can find from hard rock music is a series of solo breaks which pop up from time to time in which the rhythm section emphasizes a downbeat while one or both melodic instruments perform virtuosic riffs. The precedents in rock and pop are almost too numerous to count. In the Mega Man series, we hear them in the introduction screen of Mega Man 2. We hear them with a sort of synthesizer effect on the pulse wave channel in Mega Man 5. Generally, these operate as sort of interludes in the repetition scheme that is going to take us right back to the head of the tune, the A section. Yet another rock trope appears in the prominent use of hammer-ons throughout the series or other embellishing techniques. A hammer-on for the guitar is an embellishment in which the guitar player articulates a note and then sounds the next one by jamming their finger down hard. Um, could also be imitated on the piano or any number of other instruments with short grace notes. But we heard it in the introduction, if I can remind you of that quickly. So we hear here how they're using um, meter and backbeat. They're using rock compositional techniques like solos and things like that. And they're also being very careful about attack and articulation in order to try to imitate acoustic instruments. So finally, harmony and form. So I'd like to finish the talk with a single slightly more in-depth analysis um, to show kind of the larger project that this talk gestures towards. I'd like to discuss probably one of the most iconic tracks from the Mega Man series, the music from the first two stages of Dr. Wily's castle in Mega Man 2. a few things we hear here. First of all, we hear a rhythm that's sometimes referred to casually as the heavy metal gallop. It's in the bass. It's an eighth note followed by two sixteenth notes. 
This rhythm is ubiquitous in hard rock of the 70s and 80s. For example, Deep Purple's Highway Star, it's very fast. The harmonic schema that structures Dr. Wiley's theme also comes from hard rock music. The four harmonies shown here are central to what Philip Tagg describes as popular music's aeolian tonality. In brief, uh, Philip Tagg's book, Everyday Tonality, argues that pop music uses a lot of gestures and harmonies from the church modes, this one in particular, uh, aeolian, a type of minor that is characterized by the flat seven, flat six. Um, so, Another way to talk about this, as Hughes, Mosley, and Schaffer do in open music theory, is the lament. So, as a lament, we get a descending progression, something that gestures back towards Baroque opera and, and uh, things like When I Am Laid in Earth by, from Purcell's Dido and Aeneas. We might also hear these harmonies as a loop, with or without the five, generally without, starting in one, down to flat seven, flat six, and back. And finally, the third way to hear them that you find both in the Mega Man series and in Tag's description of Aeolian rock music tonality is what he calls a shuttle, an alternation of simply the one chord and the flat seven, generally back and forth at equal lengths as a sort of stable platform, um, which the rest of the structure may or may not reflect. The one and the flat seven kind of go together as a single tonic, um, with the one being a little dominant. Shuttles are extremely, oh, I should say, uh, I skipped a, a page here. If you look at the spreadsheet, or even if you don't, I can tell you that 37 of the 63 Mega Man tunes use some form of this progression. Um, it's an extremely big stylistic marker, just as it is in heavy metal of the 1980s. You can find it in tons of Metallica, Deep Purple, etc. So 37 of the 63 use this schema in some form, particularly as uh, the progression we just heard from Wiley, which was one, six, seven, back up to one, or in an alternating shuttle from one to flat seven, as we hear in this example from Mega Man six. So the Aeolian tonality or the lament is the most common. There are some other recognizable pop and rock progressions like the standard 1451 of Magnet Man, 1642 uh, from Gravity Man, or the Dorian 1 to 3 progression um, from Tomahawk Man and Mega Man 6. The form, finally, of Dr. Wiley's theme is one of the more complex in the Mega Man canon. The vast majority of level themes involve a short introduction followed by a two or three part main structure, which loops as the game is played. Occasionally the introductory material is included in the repetition, but usually not. You get a short intro, then generally an AB or an ABA structure that repeats. None of these tracks ever have a closing segment. They're expected to end either when you die or when you get to the boss and they simply cut off when they need to. So none of these has an ending. Um, Wiley's theme has three, oh, here is the, the uh, tonalities that I forgot to show. Wiley's theme has three distinct segments, um, and in its complexity, it almost approaches a pop song with some sort of verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge structure there in A, B, A, and C. Um, sorry, I lost my place. There we go. So in Wiley, we see an introduction labeled A that lasts for 16 measures, then eight contrasting measures labeled B, two eight measure variations on A, and then another B, and finally C that completes one large repeating structure. So much larger than a simple binary form, this almost approaches the structure of a pop song. So this is kind of the open-ended portion of the paper, my gesture towards a larger question about how gameplay and musical style might influence form in early video game music. The Mega Man soundtracks show one clear example, the frequent presence of a single introduction that falls outside the figurative open repeat sign and the lack of any ending. And the most complicated examples, like Wiley's theme or perhaps Crash Man's music from Mega Man 2, approach that same level of complexity and harmonic motion as you might find in a pop song. So this is a topic that I'm still exploring. And again, I invite you to check out the virtual handout at uh, bit.ly slash mmsoundtracks. And I welcome comments uh, and ideas in the Q&A or any time this weekend. So I just wanted to finish off with uh, 
final, one final little rendition of Wiley by an actual live band. <laughs> A band called Bit Brigade, by the way. Thank you. Thanks. So, some questions, comments, feedback? Do we have the, the cube? Uh, thanks very much. A quick question. Have you thought about the single line melody of Proto Man and how that, yeah, how that might fit that into Yeah, I cut that for time. It? Yeah, right. that was another example of sort of hammer-ons and performance techniques. Um, in fact, I think I even have it, just so we can play it and people can hear what we're talking about, I have it. Uh, on YouTube queued up. So this is a sort of motive throughout Mega Man 3 and it comes back as the credits music. You can hear them sort of using pitch bend here again. It spins out into a whole song. So this becomes a motive for Proto Man and uh, one of the things I didn't have time to talk about is actually the names of the characters in the original games. Mega Man is actually Rock Man. Um, Proto Man is Blues. And uh, Bun Bun in one of the interviews talks about how he thought of this as being a blues whistle, um, kind of a timbre. And that was sort of the inspiration for this, one of the more famous tracks from Mega Man 3. Um, and other characters throughout the series have musical names like bass and treble and, and uh, things like that. So yeah, thanks, Pete. Cut for 20 minutes. <laughs> Yeah, I'm pulling down here. All right, here we go. All right. I'm from Cleveland. You sh we should uh, have you audition for the Browns. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you looked into uh, timbre at all and register yeah. of the different uh, voices in the Mega Man series? Yeah. What I always thought interesting is how they're all kind of crammed into the same mm -hmm. octave. I wonder if you looked into that. Any yeah, thoughts on that. they are and they aren't. I have I have looked at it not in a greatly systematic way, um, but there are a lot of interesting different variations that they use. We heard some of the Gravity Man. Um, it's a combination, I think, of timbre and articulation, um, creating effects by uh, doubling up tracks or intentionally keeping the notes incredibly short and clipped. Um, can kind of help the Nintendo to create a different kind of timbre. Um, but one of the techniques that they use really systematically also is uh, kind of jumping around. A lot of times the second melody track will be sort of doing two voices at once. It will have something that's in a sort of alto register and also a really high fluttering kind of a thing. So there definitely are interesting variations on timbre when they want to get away from the standard kind of wave sound. Um, the regular square wave sound is used very frequently. Um, but it's definitely marked as a special effect in certain tracks, but I haven't looked systematically into, you know, how that's being employed or what, if there's any larger significance or, or system to the way that timbral effects are being used. Thanks. Brian. Thank you, and thank you for the clap also. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I want to know, since you've looked at all of the different Robot Master themes, mm -hmm. Have you looked into the way that the presets and for like the encoding of the chip along the lines of say Dana or Kevin's work mm -hmm. has influenced each of those compositions? I don't know if you were here last year, but Kevin Burke spoke that for the Wiley theme, the mm -hmm. famous one from Mega Man 2, mm -hmm. every note on message begins with one frame of note off so that you get that bum ba da dum ba da da dum ba da dum ba da dum bum. All those repeated mm -hmm. notes take up less memory because of that preset. And I'm wondering if the limitations of the chip influence the compositions of the Robot Master themes in other ways along those lines. Hmm. 
I wonder, that's, that's interesting. I, Kevin sent me uh, his stuff, actually, and I, I found it very helpful for preparing this talk. I haven't looked at it to that degree of seeing exactly how they were programmed. There is a, um, a direct carryover from, of the sound effects from Mega Man 1. They're reproduced exactly. They're just sort of, you know, whatever their equivalent of copying and pasting would have been. They probably had to be re-encoded, but they are encoded in exactly the same way in all of them, if you look at the NSF files. Um, and then they add, they get a vocabulary of more and more and more things, um, but they seem to be carried over very similarly. And there's also definitely a, a marked increase in complexity um, across the series, particularly four, five, and six are much more complicated, much more active. The formal structures are much longer and more ambitious. Um, so there's a trend throughout the series of going into more and more complicated structures, which actually makes something like Wiley's theme a little bit of an outlier in the early games. If you look at the spreadsheet, most of the early games are simple binary forms. And so sort of doing something that's that big and has that long of a repeating loop, it's a little bit of an anomaly in like 1987 when they're doing this. But by 91, they're doing you know much longer, more ambitious. Um, there are a couple of a-metric like introductions and things that kind of break out of that mold and then go immediately back into it. Um, so they're definitely getting more ambitious as they go along, but I've not looked into the actual, how they achieve that with the programming, if there are particular tricks for that. Right. Hello. Uh, so in talking about uh, how there are many rock bands that have done covers of Mega Man tunes, uh, do you think that uh, rock bands covering these tunes uh, is it serves to highlight the original intentions of the Capcom sound team, or does it detract from their original intentions and how they've written their songs based off of the NES's hardware limitations? I'm inclined to say that it, that it sort of highlights their intention. Um, you know, my, my way of looking at 8-bit music is that it is a little bit of a blank palette that can be interpreted in different ways. And what drew me to this project is finding it sort of striking that I really think that orchestral rendition doesn't work and trying to put my finger on why doesn't it work. It works so well for a lot of 8-bit themes, um, and a lot of them do clearly try to gesture towards that, whether it's the, you know, the sort of original um, Famicom disk system, the ability to tweak your timbres and use like the bells in Zelda and things like that, um, whether it's directly like that or simply the musical style. Like we heard from Dana's presentation, of people trying to be sort of um, to evoke archaic styles and use the timbres in that way. Um, I can't help but think that they are thinking of rock music in a lot of these tracks. Um, and so I sort of think that, that uh, people respond to that and that must be kind of the explanation for why there are absolutely so many cover bands of Mega Man songs. And I think that that's kind of, it also has the effect of kind of feeding back into itself. Once somebody realizes how well this works as a rock song, other people kind of feed into that. So there becomes this feedback loop when you're looking at 80s chiptune music being fed back through modern covers on YouTube. It's kind of a self-perpetuating cycle as well. Thanks. We, um, can we get one more question? Alan, was your hand up? Can we? Uh, I guess this isn't so much a question, it's just kind of a quick random useless little tidbit um, related to what you were saying about sound effects. Uh -huh. um, I think there's, I don't, it's not really an exception to what you said, but it's, it's one case where the Pulse 2 channel is not the only pitch channel with the sound effects and mm -hmm. with the disappearing blocks that are so infamous throughout the series. Oh, um, yeah. the, um, I don't know if it's true for every game, but in Mega Man 5 at least, I remember mm -hmm. this actually coming up last year at the conference, mm -hmm. the, um, every channel except for one of the Pulse channels, which is probably Pulse 1, mm -hmm. is involved in the sound of the disappearing block, ah. and I assume but part of that is to intentionally mask the music in those sections so the player can concentrate mm -hmm. on the, the, I guess, the musicality of the rhythm of the blocks yeah. just to be able to get past those sections rather than, they, they didn't have to do that. They could have just left it to one channel. I but anyway, thought of that. This wasn't, I, I was yeah, I, did, I think when I was that. testing and looking at sound effects, I didn't actually look for uh, a disappearing block sequence. Yeah, and that may be the only case where the triangle does sound, but I'm not sure. Yeah, it is a really big, intense sound. I yeah. went to take two seconds to hear it. Yeah, I forget if two uses the exact same, but. Yeah, there's white noise in there. in there. Sounds like the triangle is still going. 
Yep. Yeah. Thanks. I'll look into that a little bit more and see about Pulse Channels. Thank you. Oh, great question. Thank you so much, William. Thank you.